Channel Orange is Frank Ocean's first studio album following the success of his mixtape Nostalgia Ultra. The album is packed with a pretty wide cast of characters, both fictional and non-fictional, from different timelines and different eras. We go from super rich kids to drug addicts to queens of ancient Egypt and, of course, Frank Ocean himself. While all these characters live vastly different lives, they all have one thing in common. They're all navigating this obsessive nature of unrequited love. They're lying to themselves, constantly gaslighting themselves in this pursuit for their idol to return the same passion. Or put simply, they all see from the lens of orange. Let me explain. The album name Channel Orange can be interpreted in one of two ways from what I perceive. Channel Orange meaning channeling orange, and channel orange meaning the channels of orange. Starting with the latter, the album is told through a wide variety of stories with different characters and timelines, almost like each song is a separate channel of the TV guide that we source through. While listening to this album, we begin to realize that it's kind of structured like cable television. The track list acts as the shows that we can choose from. Channeling orange is in reference to synesthesia and the color Frank perceived during the summer that he first fell in love. Synesthesia is a neurological phenomenon where simulation of one sensory or cognitive pathway leads to an involuntary experience in another. For example, a person with synesthesia might perceive numbers of having specific colors, or they might associate certain sounds with distinct tastes or visual patterns. But for Frank, this manifested in the color orange, representing the summer that he fell in love. Basically, it's like a crossover episode, but for your brain. Is that Bojack Horseman? Oh jeez, here we go. Mr. Peanut Butter and Bojack Horseman in the same room. What is this, a crossover episode? When I think of the color orange, words like optimism, confidence, and enthusiasm come to mind. These are all words that I'm sure many can relate to as the same adjectives they would describe for the first love. You'll find yourself saying, everything just feels so right. This is my one person, I'm sure. I will also be willing to bet that that confidence, optimism, and enthusiasm has blinded many of us from what was actually the reality. The warm colors of summer are also reminiscent of the shades of orange. Painting the days of our warmest season like a gentle artist carefully creating every detail. Frank too paints his songs in the tint of orange. It's beautiful, it's alluring, it's perfect. But it's not reality. The fatal flaw of painting in only orange, of only seeing to this color of orange, is that too much of a good thing can turn into a bad thing for us. All of the characters we'll explore in this documentary live through this delusional fantasy described simply as orange. Essentially, they're prisoners, prisoners of their greatest desires, and forever caged to the channels of the television or the album. And the worst part is, they don't even recognize that they're imprisoned. Start is the intro to the album. It's filled with ambiance and a droning sound that feels like it's coming closer and closer to us, the listener, kind of like a car. You can also hear the sound of a PlayStation turning on. This feels to be like some type of callback to Frank's previous project, Nostalgia Ultra, which was surrounded by the same themes of cars and video games. If you listen carefully, you can hear a conversation of a guy saying they look like twins. That was embarrassing. This track, along with every other song in Channel Orange, is co-written, produced, engineered, and instrumented by James Ryan Ho. James, or Malay, has an impressive producer resume from working on classic albums like Channel Orange and Blonde, and also John Legend's Evolver. Twins here can relate to Frank and Malay working on the project together, or how both Frank's most recent projects, Channel Orange and Nostalgia Ultra, are essentially twin albums with themes of video games, cars, lost love, and nostalgia playing a major role in them. In the opening song start, we meet Frank in his environment. He's in his room, he's with his PlayStation turned on. This essentially creates the setting to where Frank's story begins, and we transition into the next track. Thinking About You at its core is a song about reflecting on a failed relationship. Here we see Frank in his messy room talking to himself about how the situation came to an end and how he's feeling about it. A tornado flew around my room before you came. Excuse the mess it made. Usually doesn't rain. 
Southern California, much like Arizona. Frank's room is used to represent his life at the moment. Before his ex-lover came into his life, it was messy and out of order. But when he met his lover, they brought peace into his life. But now that they've broken up, it makes him cry, which is as rare as rain in California and Arizona. My eyes don't shed tears, but body pour when I'm thinking about you. During the recording process of the album, Millay noticed that Frank was using boy in the song's lyrics, but dismissed this as Frank using his poetic license rather than his sexuality. But with Ocean's Tumblr letter, it confirmed Millay's suspicions to be true. In 2012, Frank Ocean's open letter revealed his personal reflections on love and relationships, specifically his first love who was another man. For the time, this was groundbreaking. Given the limited acceptance of non-heterosexual orientations, especially as a black man in the hip-hop and R&B industry, his letter challenged societal norms. It fostered conversations about acceptance and tolerance, particularly at a time where gay marriage wouldn't even be legal for three more years nationwide. Frank thinks that his first love might be his lifelong partner, but he's uncertain about their feelings. The ambiguity in the lyrics only raises questions about the status of their relationship, highlighting the complexity of the situation. No, I don't like you, I just thought you were cool enough to kick it. Got a beach outside to sell you an item. Think I don't love you, I just thought you were cute. That's why I kissed There's you. There's this overwhelming sense of ambiguity in Frank's writing. He denies romantic interest, yet he contradicts this by acknowledging their appeal. He's letting them know that he's simply thinking about them. On the podcast, Last Song Standing by Dissect, Charles Holmes explains why thinking about you has such a unique appeal that only Frank Ocean could pull off. What makes Thinking About You a way better song than people give it credit for is that it's a song that has one foot in a traditional lineage of R&B while still holding that esoteric core that Frank would build upon. On. There's a reason that when he originally writes this for Bridget Kelly, when he was still writing for other musicians, what he is saying sells the music in a way that only he could. This has one of the best opening bars in the last 10, 15 years. A tornado flew around my room before you came. Excuse the mess it made. It usually doesn't rain in Southern California, much like Arizona. My eyes don't shed tears, but boy, they pour when. Like, you don't feel that shit in your core when you hear that, Cole? It's a great line. Come That's on, great, like, I, that I, is I, like... I, for that to be the single that hits and to arrive on the scene with that, like there's a reason why he sells that line. He's not doing acrobatics. He does not sound like The weekend when he's performing it. He's just delivering it to you in this very confessional way. And that is like the skeleton key of Frank Ocean. And I think what thinking about you, what makes it so beautiful is that he is able to deliver a traditional R&B song, but in the lyrics, I don't love you, I just thought you were cute. That's why I kiss you, got a fighter jet. I don't get to fly it though I'm lying down. It's just so, who is doing that in a song? How is Bridget Kelly gonna sell that? Nothing against Bridget yeah, Kelly, yeah. but like if you give that to another artist, if you give that to a yeah. John Legend, it's not gonna hit the same. It's just not. Fertilizer? I hardly know her. Okay, that was. Fertilizer is a short interlude and is basically just a cover of James Front Leroy's song Fertilizer. This song is often overlooked, but this interlude really begins to open up the darker themes of obsession and delusion on the album. Frank is still in his room on his PlayStation before he switches through different channels to watch something. He then comes to a channel that is playing the cover of James Front Leroy's song. Frank's romantic relationship is dying. He uses the theme of fertilizer to show that he's trying to grow it back to health. And it's here where we the listeners start to realize Frank's undying desire to get anything from his lover and keep the relationship alive, even if it's literal bullshit. Frank would take that if it meant that there was any type of hope. The song's conclusion with a sudden harsh cut of laughter likely symbolizes the fact that Frank isn't receiving any more from the relationship. While the audience is aware of this, Frank remains oblivious to the reality of the situation and kind of creates this sort of inside joke or disconnection between what the audience understands and what Frank perceives. It highlights the disparity between Frank's expectations and what the actual state of the relationship is. 
Have you noticed how the album gets progressively more serious? It gets very dark. <laughs> yeah. And so fertilizer is like that, um, like a jingle on like a like a Saturday. Oh, what the? F- yeah, bro. You yeah, thought about that? In my mind, bro. Yeah. It's like a Saturday morning kids cartoon. I'll take bullshit if that's all you got. Sometimes if that's what you want from somebody, and that's all they have to offer. That's what you're gonna get. You're gonna get the bullshit. Then I love how you mentioned that because that song is so overlooked. Cause Channel Orange is very dark when you really look into it. It goes from just like, oh, I was just thinking about you, to please, for the love of God, if you have bullshit, if you have literal shit, I'll take that. <laughs> like, Sierra Leone is a coming of age story. It tells a tale of a young couple from the perspective of the boyfriend. The track's title, Sierra Leone, can be interpreted with so many literary devices in the song, but we'll just start with the sky. Sierra Leone is famous for its beautiful pink skies at sunset and sunrise. These skies end up becoming indicators for time passing throughout the song's story. In the first verse, the boyfriend and his lover are spending too much time alone. So much time alone that all they do is have sex without protection. This leads into the opening of the birth of their daughter. Claiming he ran out of Trojans, causing the horses to gallop up her throne, the couple realizes the faults of their immaturity. The boyfriend acknowledges that the constant unprotected sex is and was an immature idea. Even with the two working minimum wage jobs and living with their parents, they still have to welcome a daughter into the world. When he says, This line, Frank is using Sierra Leone as a metaphor for the girlfriend's vagina, comparing the pink skies of Sierra Leone to the pink colors of her womb. Remember, this song serves as a coming of age story. So the boyfriend didn't grow up in Sierra Leone, but he had to grow up in Sierra Leone because now he's an expecting father. The first verse ends with imagery of a sunset, symbolizing the end of the character's youthful lifestyle or his life before parenthood. In the chorus, he says, Here, Sierra Leone could be read as the name of the little girl who will be born. The second verse begins with a new dawn, symbolizing the beginning of the new life for the couple and a new life of the child being born. The boyfriend is now adjusting to this new lifestyle he'll have to get used to as he lays her in a cradle and rocks her to sleep. He mentions singing her Lennon lullaby, referencing this song, Good Night, written by John Lennon for the Beatles. The song was originally a lullaby for his son. The last line of the song is the character now grown up. He says, baby girl, if you knew what I know. Our character is watching his daughter asleep in the cradle. He's staring at the manifestation of his teenage behavior, and he's reminiscing on the moments that led up to this one. The song leaves out the details of the pregnancy, but one can assume that it wasn't easy for a broke young couple. There were likely hard decisions about abortions, attempts to get their lives in better positions, conversations with their families and their parents that they lived with. In this tranquil moment with his daughter, everything seems serene. It seems filled with promise symbolizing a new beginning yet there's this great sense of longing in his words when he says baby girl if you knew what i know he wishes that his daughter could understand the tremendous growth the change and all the sacrifices that he made for her if only she could grasp the magnitude of the trials and transformations that occurred during the night 
leading up to this new dawn and after the sunset of his old life before parenthood. It's really a heartfelt reflection on the complexity and depth of his journey into fatherhood. Sierra Leone, it was like the most dramatic and creative way to basically talk about sex <laughs> and conceiving a child. And I mean, at first glance, you might not think that that's what the song is about because he just has so much visual throughout the entire song. But the way he describes it is just so sensual and beautiful to me. Sweet Life is a song that speaks on themes of ignorance, wealth, and the butterfly effect of choices that we make in our lives. The song starts with a light, sweet bass and piano, which audibly sets the scene of an easygoing life or our character that we're going to be following in this story. The first line of the song is very powerful. It compares the character to the best song of an album. Usually the best song in an album isn't heard on the radio. So this leaves us with one of two conclusions. Either the person wasn't promising but turns out to be the best song or an unexpected surprise or the person seemed to be the best song but turned out to be a single or a disappointment. <laughs> The character we follow in this song is living in Ladera Heights, which is a wealthy area for African Americans in Southern California, or according to Reservoir Dogs, the Black Beverly Hills. It's called it Lady E. Where was she from, Compton? <laughs> from Ladera Heights. Oh, Ladera Heights, uh -huh. the Black Beverly Hills. <laughs> <laughs> Calling Ladera Heights a domesticated paradise hints to the fact that they're living in a controlled reality. The palm trees and pools may look great, but there's something slightly off about the world that they're living in. This line is a clear reference to The Matrix, where the protagonist, Neo, is given the choice of either the red pill or the blue pill. The red pill allowing him to wake up and see the grim reality of the world, or the blue pill allowing him to remain asleep and unaware of the reality of the world. Our character in Sweet Life takes the blue pill without hesitation, choosing ignorance over enlightenment. At this point, our protagonist is propelled into a mountain high where the peak is a false perception of a perfect paradise. The second verse begins with the same statement as the first verse. Our character was left with the choice at the end of the first verse, essentially the red or blue pill, ignorance or enlightenment. When the song says, but you couldn't turn your radio down, it's used as a callback and answers the questions asked in the beginning of the track. And it's here where we realize that the person seemed to be promising, but unfortunately they were just the single. Their old life before taking the blue pill is trying to reach our character here. Whether it be people from the past or their inner conscience, the character cannot hear it because the radio, the single, it's too loud. Even though they're aware of the reality of the world, the blue pill is already taking their effect and cuts off the signal, rendering them basically trapped in their precious mountain high. The character is now at the beach, something that for the most part is a constant. Meanwhile, the neighborhood is going crazy, ape shit crazy. Crime, drugs, violence, and the influence of surrounding neighbors are slipping into their heights over time. This sweet life, initially an illusion of perfection, is becoming increasingly difficult for our characters to sustain. It's not just a physical neighborhood, but a reflection of our character's own mind, where deep down they sense something is deeply wrong, but they remain trapped in this false reality they've constructed, fueled by deliberate ignorance.
The unsettling and slightly disturbing twist ending set against the backdrop of an upbeat, almost sitcom-like instrumental creates this jarring contrast between appearance and reality. In Sweet Life, the lyrics suggest a narrative where the character seeks solace and consistency at the beach, with the ocean symbolizing a constant in their life. However, as the song unfolds, it becomes very clear that this idyllic image is slowly disintegrating. It's leaving it an unsettling settling sense of disillusionment. It's as if this song is challenging us, the listener, to confront the facade of a sweet life and the darkness lurking beneath it. The song begs the question, is ignorance bliss? Why see the world when you got the beach? What I like about the music is it provides a mirror of sorts. I think one of the biggest things it can do for you is show you that you're not experiencing this alone. Because I feel like always in love, things feel like everything feels so huge, so important, so it's only me and this other person in this universe type of thing when it's just like, no, there's other people here. And I think that Frank's music does that. Luxury, loneliness, and money, all things that this story explores through the lens of super rich kids on the track titled the same name. The chorus and the beginning of the song essentially lays out the setting of a day in the life of our next character. It feels like a dream life growing up in his teen years with unlimited bottles of expensive wines and all the weed that he can smoke. Too many bottles of this wine we can't pronounce. But then we get a glimpse of what the kid is feeling inside. While he may have all these things, the rich kid's parents aren't around at all, leaving him with only maids to be a source of humanity and mentorship. On the first verse, we begin the rich kid's story on a rooftop at his skyrise penthouse, literally on top of the world. The rich kid is used to getting everything he wants. The newest and the best. Point the clicker at the tube. I prefer expensive news. Which is a genius line because of how it kind of misleads us into thinking he's actually talking about news on the TV. But here he's actually saying news, like new things in plural. New car, new girl, new watch, all the new things. He then says good times, which serves as a double entendre and a transition at the same time. Good times referring to his new watch and good times referring to the show Good Times. And this is ironic because of how the show Good Times explores the struggles and triumphs of a working class black family living in the projects. And it's at this point that we're introduced to the rich Kate's girlfriend. She was my Shower head meaning water pressure and or sets in the shower. The rich kid and his girlfriend are constantly high to the point where the maids or the help has become desensitized to this and they really just stopped caring any more than his parents did. No matter how much money the kid has, it will never do. Meaning it will never replace his need for love, real love. In the bridge of the song, Rich Kid confirms this burning need for real love, interpolating Mary J. Blige's song, Real Love. Regardless of the kid's luxurious life and ability to have anything at the snap of a finger, the kid is devoid of real, honest affection. He craves the feeling of being truly loved by someone. He's instead left with the absence of his parents and surrounded by fake friends. The second verse is told through the perspective of another super rich kid played by Earl Sweatshirt. He delivers the verse in a monotone and nonchalant way. Even though this could be because he was sick and high while recording his verse, it still reflects the unimpressed and bored mood Frank sets for the super rich kids to have. Earl starts by saying he has everything he already wants and knows that whoever's listening can't relate. So he says, 
To truly understand these super rich kids, you need to close your eyes and immerse yourself in the world. This line, particularly important towards the song's conclusion, asks us to empathize with the struggles and challenges that they confront. It's his way of asking us for our empathy, inviting us to step into their shoes and to really comprehend their reality. The major chunk of the verse is Earl painting a picture of a drug-fueled ungrateful rich kid wrecking their parents car for fun and unknowingly buying shitty weed from drug dealers who's ripping them off i mean j cole said it best right then he says Happy the last The super rich kids are latchkey kids or kids that would more often than not come home to their parents not being there because they're at work or doing something else. Raggy Ann's is a doll, but Earl uses it as a metaphor for a girl, meaning he's having sex with multiple girls in this empty house to compensate with the lack of love in his life. It's important that we see here that Earl says mammy instead of mommy in these lines. Mammy is a stereotype of an African American slave who would raise children for for white slave owners. He says this to show that it wasn't his mom that called him out on this, but it was the housekeepers because that's the closest thing that he had to an active motherly figure in his life. Even though he acts tough, he's ready to explode like a breached aqueduct. The verse ends saying this is a cry for help. Assumed to have a good life, these kids are going through their own unique pain. It's hard for people to sympathize with it unless they really try to imagine or at least just close their eyes. The third and final verse comes back to our original rich kid and ends the same way it began. <laughs> There is this overwhelming sense of nihilism in these lines. Here's our rich kid with everything he wants materialistically, but someone who has nothing emotionally. He knows nobody really cares about him, and everyone writes him off as a spoiled kid. So he feels that there's really no meaning to his life. This time when he's on the rooftop of the penthouse, he's with his girlfriend, and he's drunk. This all makes you wonder if he was having the same thoughts in the first lines of the song. This is my favorite line of the entire song because it completely encapsulates the underlying message that was trying to be said the whole time. It puts in our heads that even the disgustingly wealthy can't escape depression and loneliness. He's asking for an angel or at least the wings. These lines show that the money that he's had literally didn't mean shit. The expensive tailor suit ripped and ultimately leads to his death. Although the song didn't make it explicitly clear who grabs his arm here, I've always imagined it being his girlfriend. She's been by the side of the rich kid the entire time, and there's no lines about how she used him. I feel like silently she's always been there to support him and to make him feel a little less alone. Silently, she's been his angel he was asking for this entire time, but he didn't see it due to the fact of being blinded by extreme self-loathing. The stories here can be referring to the multiple stories of rich kids that end in a similar way or the height of the building that he's falling from. This shows how high and removed he is compared to the working class that serves him or the markets below him. The story started with the kid on top of the world and ended on the ground next to the help that ignored him. His inherent wealth and social status ironically negatively impacted his life. He's choked on a silver spoon that fed him. As his life flashes before his eyes, only then does the rich kid realize how ungrateful he's been to the only person who was really there for him. The last line is a callback to Earl's opening line. <laughs> Bring this song full circle. The rich kid has never imagined being at the bottom, just like the working class has never imagined the riches and wealth from being at the top.
Paula Jones is a song about two addicts that live together. The story starts at the end of the relationship and we hear, We once had things in common. Now the only thing we share is the refrigerator. Ice cold, baby, I told you, I'm ice cold. One of the parties of this relationship is telling the other that they've drifted away so far apart that now they have nothing in common except for this space that they live in, using the refrigerator as an example. Ice cold relates to the temperature of the refrigerator being as cold as the relationship or as a reference to Andre 3000 who appears later in the album. <laughs> These lines give perspective to the girlfriend's lifestyle with two interpretations. The first being that she's dealing weed from their home and that's how she makes a living. And the second being that she can't live without the drugs, so in turn she can't pass a drug test for a job even if she wanted to. In the first half of the first verse, we see how the girlfriend is an addict and the latter half we see how the boyfriend and the narrator is an addict as well. Here he's saying that she's both selling drugs and using them. But with him criticizing his girlfriend, we realize that she knows how to control men with sex. Most likely meaning that the boyfriend is being used for his home at this point. But he doesn't realize it because of his addiction to her or to her kiss. <laughs> Having the jones or jonesing for something is to have an intense craving for something. More times than not, it's usually about drugs, but when it comes to jonesing for another person, it's called love jones. This track explores both types of jonesing simultaneously. The woman is addicted to drugs and uses the man for a place to stay. The man is addicted to the woman and judges her for addiction to drugs, not realizing that he himself is addicted to her touch, her kiss, her love. This is why most of the lyrics in the song can be interpreted in two ways, further portraying the track's theme of duality. In the second verse, the girl comes home high and drunk again. This leaves the man wondering why he keeps helping her at this point. It's also notable that he says, my lawn, most likely meaning that he's grown sick of living with her and moved out. But the plan of action doesn't matter because she keeps coming up to his new place. She's attempting to get him hooked again, not just with sex, but this time with a child. The man stuck in a dry spell for so long succumbs to her love truck. <laughs> In the third and final verse, the man comes to terms that he isn't all that better than her like he thought he was. I thought I was above you. He always had the idea in his head that his morals were stronger. The man realizes that through her, he himself has become an addict. Now high off love, the man accepts his vices so he can be high without guilt with her. Ending the song exactly where it started, essentially making the song a complete infinite loop. So like Frank, he had went through the shit. So it's someone who already went through this type of stuff. He does the process for you mm -hmm. and you live vicariously through him. And so he's going through it. Your ass is going through it. And you know, y'all both collectively going through it. It helps ease your boat along in the wave of pain, suffering to you get to the shore. It really gets you to the shore at that point. The song Crack Rock follows a man overcome with drug addiction. The story starts at the end of a drug addict's high in Little Arkansas. Arkansas is a state notorious for its high volume of crack usage. Little Rock is also the capital of Arkansas, making the opening line serve as a double entendre to where the crack addict is locationally in the middle of Little Rock, Arkansas and literally having a Little Rock left in her pipe so they can't get high. The lines following also serve as a double entendre when he says, You 
used to hit and run. This is referring to unprotected sex with his ex-lover or in reference to cocaine, which is nicknamed White Girl. Also, crack is a processed form of cocaine, so cocaine is crack in its rawest form and a lot more expensive, most likely alluding to the fact that he used to do cocaine, but he can't afford it anymore, so now he does crack. In the chorus of the song, Frank sings, Hidden stones in glass homes. This is a play on the idiom, people who live in glass houses shouldn't throw stones, giving up two possible meanings stones referring to crack rocks and glass homes being a metaphor for crack pipes being made of glass as he lives in his crack pipe <laughs> i'm sorry just a song about a crackhead is so funny like i get what he's saying but it's just funny to like i don't know so this line paints a picture of the limps our protagonists of the track would go to fuel their addiction going to crack houses and trap houses to smoke which are abandoned by the original owners this line calls back to the first line of the chorus basically saying if you develop a strong enough addiction it'll tear apart your family and relationships the second verse paints a picture of where they are socially because of their addiction they're no longer in control and their family wants nothing to do with them due to their habits of stealing and doing whatever they need to do to get that next high <laughs> The song then goes into a bridge describing crooked cops. This line refers to crooked cops who would aid the growth of the drug trade. These cops would let crack dealers deal as long as they got a cut of the profits. Basically here he's saying that crooked cops are as good as dead cops because they're not helping the community that they're supposed to serve. Instead, they're serving the community they're supposed to protect. See what I did there? This one always reminds me of Marvin Gaye's sound. And I couldn't really find any sources backing this up on an intended influence. So the source is me. In these lines, he's highlighting the stark contrast between the consequences of a cooker cop being shot and the tragic fate of his own brother or another black man suffering a similar fate. It underscores the disturbing hypocrisy of this reality, particularly when considering the considerable influence that corrupt law enforcement officers hold over their communities. The song's conclusion is both abrupt and subdued, creating a stark contrast with its initial high energy characterized by high-pitched vocals with a large soundscape the final sung note of crack rock is reminiscent of the last crack rock in our protagonist pipe this juxtaposition of the low and crash of the high leaves us the listener yearning for more and it leaves us feeling like a crack <laughs> okay i'm done i'm done talking about this song i Pyramid serves as a compelling narrative that delves into the rich ancient history of the societal hierarchy among black women and the unfortunate decline from a queen in her homeland to a degrading role in Western cultures and societies. The story is told from the perspective of five characters and through two time periods, ancient Egypt and modern America. The first part starts in ancient Egypt from the perspective of a pharaoh or a king. And this pharaoh realizes that Cleopatra, his queen, has been kidnapped, so he sends an army to find her. <laughs> Pharaoh feels that his dignity and his power has been stripped from him, calling her his glory. This is actually what Cleopatra means in Greek, meaning glory of the father. We now cut to a man running with Cleopatra, promising her a future of diamonds in a dark and gloomy world. This also sounds like promises a pimp would make to a girl he's trying to turn out, which is a foreshadow of what's to come later in the story. The second verse of this song, we cut back to the pharaoh, and he just found out that Cleopatra wasn't kidnapped, but that she ran away with another man. Plot twist, I know, right? <laughs> The 
Pharaoh at this point becomes desperate once he realizes that she left him on her own free will. The jewel of Africa, the Pharaoh's other half separated from him and left him for Samson, another biblical judge or military leader of the Israelites. Them doesn't really matter. What matters is the Pharaoh found his queen laying with another man, and this infuriates him. So he wishes her bad dreams or a bad future. <laughs> Historically, Cleopatra ends her life after Mark Anthony, her lover, loses the battle of Actium. I hope I'm saying that right. And the outro of the first part references that historic event. The song then goes into this techno-like club style transition, segueing us into the next part of the song or into the future. On the side of the transition, we find ourselves hearing the perspective of a pimp in his motel room. The first line suggests that the cheetahs or cheetahs waking up are still lying together but in present day. This line is symbolic of where Cleo was and where she's at now. Big Sun is an obvious nod to the Egyptian sun god Ra. The sun is being filtered through the blinds of the motel. And this is symbolic of Cleopatra's true Egyptian greatness being filtered and reduced into the impurity and degradation of a modern day prostitute. Here we see Cleo getting dressed for her day from the perspective of her pimp. She then heads to the pyramids to find potential clients. The pyramids or the Luxor in Las Vegas is most likely where she finds her clients. Luxor is also a city in Egypt, which adds to the Egyptian theme of the song. She's working at the pyramids tonight. While Cleo is working as a prostitute at the pyramids, we get a visual of the lifestyle that the pimp has. Top floor of a motel, which is likely just the second floor of a motel from the equally shitty room as the first floor, and a model TV, which is probably the only TV he could afford or the easiest to steal. He owns a nice chain and car, but can't afford to put gas in it, showing that he prioritizes style over functionality. Here the pimp says your girl instead of his girl, likely referring to the first part of the song as he still has Cleopatra under his control. With the control over her, he uses Cleopatra to keep his bills paid. The last verse of the song is now from the perspective of our fifth character, which is the loser. The loser appears to be modern day Cleo's ex-lover before the pimp took her, which is why he said your girl. Despite that, he still sees her because he has a deep connection with her. The loser is living in this false reality painted by Cleo that she still loves him. She's skilled at the art of seduction and makes the loser feel comfortable and confident. But then we're hit with the twist of the song. But your love ain't free. It's at this point that we realize that present day Cleo's client who didn't have to pay for her love is referring to a past life that they both once lived. The powerful pharaoh, now a loser. The beautiful queen Cleopatra, now a common prostitute. And the thief Samson, now a pimp. This single line is genius because it brings the track full circle. It tells a narrative of an unhealthy devotion and commentary on the unfortunate fall from grace societally speaking, of the black woman. I think the reason I loved Channel Orange so much was because it put everything I was feeling into so many beautiful words. Like it was a sucky experience, but 
it made it sound so beautiful, but also relatable. So when I was first listening to that um, project back in middle school, it was good. It, it felt good knowing that I, you're not the only person dealing with those feelings of unrequited love. You're not the only person dealing with heartbreak. All those things are a universal human experience. And when you have music that you can relate to in that way, it's just a great reminder of that. You know, so I, I listened to that album quite a bit, even after middle school, whenever I was feeling heartbroken or not too confident in myself. And it just really made me feel better because I just reminded myself like, yo, even Frank Ocean is going through it. <laughs> Lost tells the story of a drug dealer who loves his girlfriend dearly. The drug dealer ends up regrettably getting his girlfriend into his drug business. Introducing his girlfriend through her bra size sets the tone for the song. He then compares the weight of his love for her to a triple weight, which itself couldn't measure how much he loves her. At the end of the verse, he encourages her to work with him selling and moving drugs. The second verse shows where the couple is at as a result of the work that they've done together. We're living a richer lifestyle and now we've gotten into a routine. The motif of triple weight comes up again in this verse as well. And this time instead of the weight of love he has for her, he's weighing the drugs he's going to put on her to transport. He also mentions his girlfriend's breast again, saying, He's saying this is likely because they've been hiding the drugs in her double deep breast, and he says that he'll never let her get caught. The chorus then plays again, signaling that more time is going by. I like to think of the chorus of this track acting as a montage of the couple running drugs around the world. However, there's a twist to this visual metaphor. It's viewed through the regretful boyfriend's eyes. With each chorus, he witnesses the woman he cares about descending further and further into the perilous clutches of this lifestyle. Amplifying the sense of hopelessness that lingers throughout the song. The boyfriend watching this fantasizes about her cooking meals for their family instead one day. The boyfriend didn't necessarily mean to corrupt his girlfriend, but she's lost and she's diluted and she thinks this is the life that they should live instead. Nothing wrong with a lie. This echoes the all too familiar, just one more time, I promise, just one more job, just one more trip. It's a sentiment often used by addicts, a sort of deceptive mantra that offers a false comfort. However, the boyfriend is well aware of the deception. He sees through it all. This suggests that he too is being drawn deeper into the same lifestyle. Now, given this context, it becomes increasingly difficult to trust our narrator's honesty throughout the entire story. When he initially says, whipping up meals for my family, it may be a promise he makes to her, but deep down, it's likely that he realizes that the scenario will never materialize. As they both become entangled in this destructive lifestyle, they board yet another short plane ride. As the TV clicks off, we find ourselves back in Frank's room where he's channel surfing. Frank sits and observes the protagonists of these tales living their lives through an orange tinted lens. A subtle note worth mentioning is the inclusion of Mano Cereba, Spanish for hands up, at the end of the song. This detail hints at the fate of our drug mule couple, perhaps signifying their eventual capture. I think it's like one of the worst things on the planet. 
it's just like and this was really hard for me too because I, I am kind of a liar just generally I don't know why it's just fun to lie I started lying about important things after him I didn't used to lie about important things and so what I kind of realized was that's like the opposite 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 of love the person that you love and the person that you care about is the one that you should be doing like the most to like show up and be like your authentic self as but I do get it because there's always a fear that you'll love somebody and you'll give them who you are and then they're like yeah fuck you and what you stand for I'm cool off you you know so there is like a, I understand it because that's how you get to keep her is by lying but it's like if it's meant to be then yeah, it'll be regardless Finally leaving his room, Frank finds himself in a taxi cab and attempts to create a makeshift therapy session. He lets the taxi driver know he has a lot to say and the purpose of the ride is to more so have somebody to talk to rather than to drive to a destination. So take the streets if you wanna. In the course of the song, Frank lists different religions that he could have joined, and he relates these religions to the act of unrequited love, unreturned affection, and devotion. Realizing that more than a bad religion, this act is no different than being a part of a cult where the followers are conditioned to believe there's no way to live outside of it and used by the leaders to advance their own personal agendas. When Frank sings, He's referencing Jim Jones of the People's Temple in the 1970s. Frank here is saying unrequited love can be just as self-destructive as joining these cults because he lost sight of reality as a consequence of his obsession. I can never make him love me. Frank sits in this emotion, in this feeling, in this realization, echoing the words over and over. Almost like Frank has to decondition himself from thinking that he is loved by him. These lines also remind me of one of the last scenes in Goodwill Hunting. It's not your fault. On the second verse, one Frank says, I swear I've got three lives balanced on my head like stick knife. It likely refers to his personal life, his public life as a performer, and his private life as someone who has it came out at the time of writing the song. I can't tell you the truth about my disguise. I can't trust no one. He's struggling to reveal that he was with a man in the first place before he could even talk about the unrequited love. It's a bad religion. To be in love, someone who could never love you. Here we witness Frank go through this profound transformation. It's as if he's conducting an emotional exorcism, confronting the deep-rooted grief, bitterness, and disappointment that's been haunting him throughout this failed relationship. He's come to a starting revelation, recognizing that he's been idealizing his lover with devotion similar to the worship of a god. The weight of this realization clearly bears heavily on his soul as he grapples with the painful truth that his love may never be returned. Only bad religion could have me feel the way I do. With newfound clarity about the roots of his suffering and inherent flaws in unrequited love, Frank now stands at a crossroads, poised to break free from the shackles of a one-sided connection. But even as the track draws to a close, his path forward remains shrouded in uncertainty and ambiguity. Frank has no idea how to accomplish this, leading us into the next track. Ooh. 
Pink Matter is a deeply philosophical and existential song about consciousness and our significance in the universe. Here, Frank ponders these questions with his sensei or his teacher when he asks. What do you think my friend is playing for? Is it just a container for the mind? The question is known in philosophy as the mind-body problem, which challenges thinkers to explain the relationship between our brain and our consciousness. This is obviously something Frank thinks about often because years later on his follow-up album Blonde, he asks these same questions on the song by Ferrari. The sensei replies to this question not with an answer, but with another question. There's a lot of skepticism in this line, almost as if the sensei is asking Frank to challenge his own thought process, saying, if the brain is just a container for the mind, then is a woman just a container for a child? This line also gives context to the name of the track. Gray matter is the substance that makes up the brain. So in relation, he's saying pink matter is the substance that makes up a vagina. In the second verse of the song, Frank asks, What are the sky and the stars for sure? Here Frank is questioning our place as humans in a universe, assuming the existence of alien life and creating a what if scenario of us existing purely for the entertainment of extraterrestrial life. Frank Sensei, still holding a cynical mood, couldn't come up with any answer or response to Frank's question, so out of frustration. In turn, this still kind of answers Frank's question, coming to the conclusion that nothing mattered. These lines also offer insight to the identity of his sensei. Frank finds himself engaged in an internal debate pondering the existence of extraterrestrial life, the creation of the universe, and the concept of God. His logic grapples with his spirituality, and his mind contrasts his body. The third verse is a feature from the legend himself, Andre 3000. I don't need to explain how good of a wordsmith he is, but Andre delivers an emotional, vulnerable story about regret and the desire for a connection to continue Frank's theme, the track set before him. The opening line, since you've been gone, I've been having withdrawals, immediately sets the tone, portraying a sense of longing and nostalgia for someone who was once a significant part of their life. There's a subtle acknowledgement of regret. He states that this person was taken for granted, describing them as such a habit to call. But the verse takes an unexpected turn when Andre suggests that this person might find happiness with someone else, demonstrating this selfless perspective. On the bridge of the song, there's a very important narrative progressor and realization that Frank has when he says, Here Frank has a flash of remembrance before his aunt's tinted life following meeting his ex-lover. He remembers that blue used to be his favorite color, but he has no choice but to live in arms because he's stuck in this one-man call, this obsession for another, this unrequited love, and now all he sees is arms, so he has no choice. In the last line of the bridge, he takes a bold step in the direction of healing when he says, at the end of the track, Andre leaves us with an outro that sums up both his and Frank's feelings about the ex-lovers. Their partners seem to struggle when it comes to doing things that nurture a healthy relationship but excel at actions that undermine it. This paradox highlights the complex dynamics at play within these relationships where the delicate balance between love and turmoil becomes a reoccurring theme. It's a reminder that sometimes even with the best intentions, we inadvertently contribute to the very problems we seek to avoid, ultimately leaving a trail of emotional turmoil in our wake. Unless, of course, 
we do something about it. It's really a song about longing. Like if you take uh, Andre 3000's verse, since you've been gone up in heaven with draws, that's like the ultimate form of longing. That is at that point an addiction at that point. I've been in situations where, yeah, you feel like, damn, you like going through withdrawal symptoms, not even like just from not losing a person, but just being like not with them at the moment. That's how powerful love can be. Sometimes you can feel as though you're you're on a pipe. You're a pipe head. That's how it can be in terms of just like it grips you. And I think that um, Frank and Andre 3000, which is this, like I said, this is one of his best verses ever. Top three. Um, they were able to encapsulate that perfectly. Forrest Gump is the last narrative track on Channel Orange. Written through the perspective of Jenny, Forrest Gump's love interest, the song serves as a metaphor for Frank's feelings towards his first love and how they evolved and matured over time. The first line of the song refers to Jenny's perspective while watching Forrest from afar. My fingertips, my lips, they burn the cigarette. Jenny is a smoker and Forrest hates cigarettes. The cigarettes are symbolic of the differences Jenny and Forrest have, and Frank compares this to him and his ex-lover. In the same way Jenny smokes and Forrest hates it, Frank and his ex-lover have fundamental differences that drive a wedge between them, and this leaves Frank isolated. With use of this iconic line from the movie, Frank continues to speak on his relationship through the eyes of Jenny watching from afar. When the line, run Forrest run, is said in the movie, it symbolized Forrest growing up throughout the movie at different points. The two short verses in the song shows Jenny still watching Forrest from afar at his football games and admiring his gentle but strong demeanor. But it's the outro of the track that really wraps up the entire album and all of the stories in a neat bow, giving us a feeling of bliss when Frank said, now for his green, for his blues, I'm remembering you. For his green, for his blues, Frank is finally seeing the world without the tint of orange. Taking off the orange tinted glasses, if you will. Learning from all of the stories he's seen while watching TV, Frank is making a conscious decision not to follow the same path as the other characters who lived in orange. Instead, he's choosing to simply remember his ex-lover, remember the times that they had, and remember the summer he fell in love, the summer of orange, while looking forward to new memories and to other colors that the world has to offer. This is love, I know it's true, I won't forget you. There's a great deal of honesty in this line, even though he's woken up from this orange brainwashing, he still second guesses himself when he says, if this is love, I know it's true. The whistling at the end of the song gives us this cathartic feeling. One can imagine Frank just sitting in a good mood, enjoying the moment he's in and leisurely whistling. It gives us a good feeling, like he knows everything isn't okay, but everything is perfect. Love is a paradox. It's something that philosophers have been pondering on for years and years. Have you ever thought of your definition of love? The emotion of love? I don't know. I mean, you can look at love in so many ways. Just a perfect day. So the perfect day for me. My perfect day. Perfect day for me. Perfect day for me. Perfect day looks similar to my birthday, honestly. Love, they say, makes the world go round, but. What is it really? Is it the rapid heartbeat at the sight of someone special? Is it the ache that lingers in us when they're far away? Is it the quiet comfort of a shared glance, a shared history? Or is it what transforms us, molds us into something more, something greater? Maybe a more authentic version of ourselves. Watching the sun. Out in nature. I'd be with a couple of friends and we'd just be hiking through like a forest or something. Or the trees. Maybe later that night going stargazing or something. No phones, no light pollution, none of that. Just us, you know? Day where I love more than anything. And when it's nighttime, bro, and the stars come out and there's like color in the sky, that's really special, you know? Special. I'm constantly like laughing and enjoying other people's presence. But love isn't just about others, it's also about us about the reflection in the mirror, 
The one who looks back with hopes, dreams, flaws, and fears. Can I love myself in my entirety? Can I embrace my imperfections, my doubts, my scars? Can I do that with the same tenderness that I offer to those I hold dear? Being around people who I love and saying, this is what I want, I feel safe here. Watching movies, TV, whatever, anime, you know, get a little action in with my shorties. Freedom to do whatever it is that I want. Do I want to watch Netflix and binge something? Just closing my eyes and thinking, Things are all right. Bring light into someone else's world for that day. Sit and ponder life's greatest mysteries. Or maybe let's go back to sleep. Yeah, some people would say sun shining. Some people say they got up out of bed. Somebody like me. I feel like a good morning to me would be waking up to your face. It's like looking in a kaleidoscope of emotions. Each turn revealing a new pattern, a new hue. Sometimes it's as gentle as a whisper, a soft touch that warms the soul brings a smile that dances in our eyes. Not only being there for myself, but also being there for others. Everybody's just catering to me, making sure I'm enjoying every aspect of the day that is in for Being myself, because when, when I'm not feeling good about being myself with surroundings of people, that just ruins my whole day, the whole vibe, the whole mood, you know what I mean? And enjoy my own presence and just not feel lonely because it's a big difference between being alone and feeling lonely. I don't want to feel lonely, I just, if I can enjoy my own presence and still feel okay with not necessarily seeing anyone, I'm okay with that. That's a perfect day for me. Other times it's fierce and wild, threatening to consume everything in its path. Overcome with passion and a surge of fire, we can burn ourselves or even other people before we even realize it. Is that fair though? Do we get an excuse to rampage and consume everything in front of us just because it's out of A special thank you to the Patreon members who support my channel. You guys have really helped me realize my aspirations of creating videos just like this full time. And if you want to join my Patreon to get videos ad free and earlier than I put them on YouTube, then you can click the link in this video's description and join for only $3. It's an easy way to help support me as an artist and a filmmaker. Also, check out our Discord if you haven't. It's linked down in the description. We're active there every single day with conversation and daily activities.